Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Good afternoon, President Althea, fellow Rotarians, visitors, and guests. I'm Tom Adams, and I have the privilege today of introducing Jim Warner, who is the CEO of the Lancaster County Solid Waste Management Authority and whom I've worked for for the last 13 years. I've spoken with many of you over the last year and a half that I've been a Rotarian about our approach to managing waste. And I think one of the common themes that comes out in those conversations is the appreciation this group has for the way our, our organization operates as a business to maximize fiscal responsibility and in turn um, make the highest positive impact on the community that we serve. Jim's uh, strong vision and what we can call unwavering pursuit of excellence uh, in everything that we do has allowed us to grow from kind of very humble beginnings to a nationally recognized organization with uh, very few equals in our field. And at this time, I'd like to invite Jim to the podium to discuss the uh, impressive evolution under his leadership of managing waste in Lancaster County. Well, thank you, Tom. Um, maybe I have had something to do with it. I don't know. Um, but anyway, I, I want to point out that Tom Adams and Katie Sando here are two very, very important members of our executive team at Lixwama. Um, we, we have myself and uh, an executive team of six that run the organization, and uh, they both have um, lots of responsibility for uh, carrying out um, the standards uh, that we employ and for a lot of the success for what I'm going to go over here today. So um, I was asked, you know, you've been here before, right? And um, I, I have many times. And um, I, I think this might be about my fifth time, but never before have I attempted to cover 30 years in 30 minutes, okay? <laughs> and that's, that's what we're gonna try to do here today. I know you have a, a hard stop at 1.30, but I'm, I'm gonna get through uh, this. And well, I don't know, I just sort of put it together with Katie's help, so I'm not really sure how long it's gonna take, but I'm, I'll be sure to, um, I, I can speak, you know, hour upon hour on this stuff, but I want to I want to leave at least a good 10 minutes for Q&A because this is something that uh, impacts everybody. We all participate in generating waste and 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 uh, you know the, the recycling which is all over the news now for reasons maybe we'll get some time to discuss. But um, but we do really have pretty humble beginnings here. Um, I started in uh, July of 1987. So last month I had my 31st anniversary with Lixwama. Um, and the organization looks nothing uh, like it did then. And uh, we've come a long way. We, we've, we've sort of set a pace and, and we've been able to establish ourselves in our industry as, as, a, as a system to emulate around the country. Um, we don't do everything the best, but from an integrated standpoint, um, we, we do a lot. And um, it gotten, it's, has gotten so much more complicated than it used to be. And um, I'll try to cover some of that. So we have a system here. Um, I'm going to use the hard copy, and Katie's going to keep an eye on me, and uh, she's going to uh, she's gonna click the button as I flip. So um, I guess the first thing is just to give you an orientation for what are our primary assets besides our people. I don't have photos of all you know, our people. But, but we do have, we have four primary locations of our business and, and these facilities or assets as I refer to them are what enable us to manage, physically manage the waste. And, and um, we, we have, we're very unique in that we have two waste energy plants. And the U.S. is down to about 76 operating waste energy plants. And, and we own two of them. So um, obviously that's not a, a technology as effective as it is for a whole lot of reasons that aren't part of today's presentation. They just have not continued to be built. But, uh, the last one built was in uh, Palm Beach, uh, Florida, a couple years ago. And before that, the last one 
was in Montgomery County, Maryland in 1995. So there, while Europe and the Pacific Rim continues to uh, build waste energy plants as an alternative to managed waste in the U.S., that is not happening. So our, our, there are, our, our other asset is our landfill out in Conestoga, PA, next to Turkey Hill Dairy. And then probably the location that most of you are most familiar with is our transfer station out on Harrisburg Pike, which also has our household hazardous waste facility. I always ask how many of you have driven through there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that's why we had about 75,000 drive-throughs last year. And, um, and then our corporate office is uh, also out there that with the uh, bowstring trusses and so forth. So we're going to look back and uh, see how we established the critical infrastructure. And um, we'll, we'll sort of go from there. But you know, when I was getting started, I had a couple years experience in the business coming out of graduate school before I came to Lancaster. And it, it was a great time to get started in this field because um, waste management was just beginning to grow up regulations were passed that said you can no longer put the waste in in a ditch somewhere an unlined location so there was a great consolidation from tens of thousands of little municipal landfills to landfills that were engineered with environmental protection and controls and our predecessor agency lara uh, had a little operation out there on harrisburg pike which you see in the photo and uh, they operated um, a little transfer station and that transfer station was actually built in 1968 um, because they had run out of locations to dump the waste locally out by the brickyards down at Lancaster County Park and a couple other locations so they bought a farm out in along the river in Crest, the village of Cresswell and then they had to decide how are we going to get the waste from here in and around the city way out there. So they built this transfer station in 1968. So when I joined, um, I can still remember, I, I got an invitation to have an interview and the letterhead said Lara. Um, and then when I got a job offer, it said Lakswama. So I was sort of right there at the very beginning, one of the first employees. And um, shortly thereafter, Pennsylvania passed an all-encompassing waste management law that it was amongst other things it it it, um, it parceled the responsibility of managing waste to counties and it also mandated that local government units were going to have to start um, collecting and recycling along with the waste um, in 1989 uh, back in 88 89 we borrowed a whole lot of money through public revenue bonds about hundred and seventy five million dollars and we used some of that to build what is now the fry the fry farm landfill we we uh, opened that in 1989 and during that when we opened that we were also constructing the waste energy plant up in Kanoi Township there you can see the stack in the lower photo along with the um, bunker wall and that was about hundred and thirty million dollars so this little agency uh, that had a budget of under 15, 20 million dollars a year, all of a sudden had these two big assets, spent all this money, and um, uh, had to grow up real fast because at the time there was about a 20 million dollar annual debt service that, that went along with repaying back that debt. So also in 91 is when the, the first curbside started. So all of a sudden we, we had the components of this integrated plan. We were going to try to fulfill the goals which were to make that landfill investment last as long as possible. And we were going to, we were going to do it two ways. We were going to institute recycling throughout the county, and then we were going to uh, utilize combustion, the reduction you get. You know, you, you take a log, put it in a fireplace, it's this big, at the end it's a handful of ash. Same thing. Uh, the, the waste energy plant reduces the volume of the waste, which makes the landfill last as long as possible. So I have a couple slides to demonstrate this. So what you see on the slide in front of you is 100 cubic yards of waste. That's about the amount of waste that's in one of our big trailers. And when it is processed through the waste energy plant, what's left is that 
inert pile of ash. So you go from 100 cubic yards to 10 cubic yards. And while the weight reduction is only about 10%, it's the volume reduction that's important. Landfills don't fill up, fill up because they're too heavy. They fill up because they get too full. Um, and in the meantime, in the meantime, we're going to generate about 13,000 kilowatt hours of waste from that uh, of electricity from that material, which is enough to power the average home for about a year. This is uh, this is another way to look at it. Um, so if we hadn't, if we kept doing what we used to be doing in the 70s and the 80s, and not attacking this through a big investment and integrated approaches, we would be using almost a million cubic yards of space every year. But instead, because we pull out and recycle 40 plus percent of the waste and then combust the remaining, um, we, we reduce that cubic yard component usage of the landfill down to um, about 55,000 cubic yards. So, so what has that meant? What if we had not uh, made this investment, and what if we had just in, continued what we were doing in the 70s, 70s and 80s? The, the landfill, when you, when you get a landfill permitted, you get X amount of space. And our X factor for the Fry Farm landfill was about 10.6 million cubic yards. Modest for, for a landfill. There's some landfills that are much, much bigger. And, and you may recall we opened the landfill in, um, in 1989. So this shows you what our scheduled consumption would have been if we weren't employing waste energy. The landfill that we're still using today in 2018 would have been full in the year 2000. Now, the time to develop and permit a landfill can run you a decade. And um, so by the time we opened in 2089, we, we, we would have had to have been already looking for the next expansion uh, with only a 10-year life. You, you, it's very hard to pay off a landfill, make it economical, when you only have a 10-year life. So what we've been able to do is open the landfill in 89, and we're just about out of room now in 2018. We're scheduled for 2019. So we're getting a 30-year life to that asset for that same bubble of space that we would have, would have otherwise filled up. And one of the reasons for that is because the recycling growth. Back in 1990, the community was recycling about 5%. And we've continued to grow that recycling where we're now up to about 44%. So what that does is it, it pulls 44% out of these physical assets that, or it pulls it out before it actually goes in. You know, what, what businesses are doing, what curbside recycling is removing, our, our assets and investment doesn't need to be as big because um, we're recycling 44% uh, of the waste. So, uh, you know, I did mention that we, we own two of the 76 waste energy plants in the U.S., but how you, how you so it's somewhat unique. But when you look around the United States, um, the pie chart on the left, here's Lancaster County, where of the municipal waste, and, and when I talk about municipal waste, I'm referring to the waste you're most familiar with. Uh, stuff from uh, institutions, your house, uh, and businesses. And um, in Lancaster County, uh, typical year, we'll recycle, there's the 44% you saw in the previous chart. 52.5% is going to go in and, remake, and make renewable energy, and we also recover metal out of that. And we're only going to landfill 3.5%. That's why we have a 30-year life to that asset. Whereas in the U.S., it's virtually the opposite. Landfilling is what dominates the uh, disposal technique in the U.S. Why is that? Because the U.S. has always had abundant land, and land was cheap, and um, waste tends to gravitate to the lowest cost technology. Building a waste energy plant is not the cheapest way to get rid of your waste, but it was decisions made 
that match the values of Lancaster County, and that was to preserve our farmland and minim minimize land consumption. So you can see our recycling is about 10 points better, but the main, the main driver is our presence of uh, waste energy where it's not used as much throughout the U.S. So while we were um, employing waste energy, um, which has become a lot more difficult these days with $25 electricity, um, uh, natural gas is great for all of us as consumers because it, it lowers our heating bills, but um, for, the, for people that are in the business of generating electricity, it hasn't been very good because uh, prices have plummeted and the two main, the, the two ways we make money running those power plants is charging a disposal fee for the trash to be disposed and on the back end selling electricity. So along the way, um, our business plan was one where um, initially, when we got started, it was like, we're only gonna serve Lancaster County. And that, that was the feeling back then. But when, when, we, when we developed these assets, we didn't build the waste energy plant so that it would be full from day one. We built it so that knowing Lancaster was a growing community and we, uh, it would have capacity to uh, be utilized as the community grew. And for each one person uh, of population that we gained, that's one ton of waste. Now, about 1,600 pounds of that will come into the system and the other 400 might, might get recycled. But um, we, we need capacity and eventually we looked at utilizing the full capacity of the waste energy plant. But we looked throughout the whole system and we, and we looked at how could we integrate new technologies to help diversify our revenue model and, and not, raise, not raise rates. So one of them was landfill gas energy. Uh, we just started, we started to invest in, in renewable energy technologies that had certain synergistic relationships within our system. So this one was with, at the time, PPL had a renewable energy business development arm. And we did this project in 2005 where we um, got the methane gas in the landfill, capture it, put it through combustion engines, which are connected to a generator and we make electrons and they're sold out to the grid. Another one, uh, most of you uh, may recall when this was being constructed, um, the landfill, the uh, transfer station complex, uh, we went from a little rinky dink five acre site to 10 acres, which took 10 years because of, um, we had to acquire four small properties along the way and um, built this, transfer complex that could now uh, manage the uh, growth that we were seeing. And, and the, I think the first year we opened this in 2007 or eight, we had um, about 280,000 tons and now we're up to about 350,000 uh, tons. And, and of course the, the household has this waste traffic is considerable. So we have about 500 vehicles coming in and out of here a day. But one thing you'll notice is um, there's also um, some solar on the roofs there, so we, we added a um, solar project here as well. But it was mostly infrastructure. We had to be able to get the waste in here and out. Um, and what this does, this station consolidates material so that all the little trucks don't have to be going all the way out Route 30 on River Road and left to the landfill or uh, north up to the waste energy plant. This reduces traffic about 85%. Another thing we did was, um, you know, just being on top of our landfill, which is on a promontory 250 feet above the Susquehanna water elevation, uh, it's windy. So years ago, um, we thought, well, maybe, maybe we can develop a wind energy project up here because we have a large base user in Turkey Hill Dairy. They have a constant four megawatt draw for their production. And, and so this was a, a really cool project. It's still the only commercial wind project in central Pennsylvania, in lower, Sus lower central PA. And it's the only one around where it's actually plugged into a, a, in a retail type development. You know, it's not, uh, the energy here is not going out 
into the grid, it, pro it provides 25% of Turkey Hill's electricity to make ice cream and iced tea. And then I already sort of covered the transfer station project. So in 2012, we put this solar project on our roofs there. And on an annual true up basis now, uh, we're able to um, produce for ourselves 80% of all the electricity that we use throughout the complex on an annual basis. And um, the reason my hair is more gray than not um, is um, as we continue to grow um, and our waste energy plant was full, uh, we, we looked at um, the situation going on, going up in Harrisburg. Um, th th this, this would be a great presentation if I had two hours just on this. But the fact is, is that we acquired this plant uh, the, you know, the distressed Harrisburg incinerator had a terrible reputation, um, but with a little uh, tender loving care and some investment and some know-how, bringing our knowledge to that asset, uh, we acquired this and we, we now uh, operate by contract uh, to, with Dolphin County and the city of Harrisburg to manage all their waste for the next 20 years, now about 15 more years. So uh, we've done quite well here. We've made an investment of about 20 million, but most importantly, what it gives us is uh, the, the, the County of Dolphin and City of Harrisburg only use about two thirds of the capacity there. So as we continue to grow here, we're, we'll be able to access that through our transfer station um, and send our waste up there where we can continue to get combustion of the waste and save landfill space rather than be maxed out of the current capacity we have at the Lancaster plant. Another thing we did was um, compress natural gas. Uh, compressed natural gas can be a transportation fuel. Uh, there's a, a, a UGI distribution line running right down the Harrisburg Pike, right past our place. So we decided to, we got out of the diesel business. We no longer run our trucks on diesel in 2014. Uh, we bought 16 uh, compressed natural gas tractors. This was the first year that the uh, large engine that we need was provided uh, out in the industry. And um, we've had great success with them. And uh, so, so we run, now run cheaper and cleaner uh, when we're transporting waste from Lancaster uh, out to the landfill or up to the waste energy plant. And then um, probably our most uh, recent is, is um, steamed energy. And up in Lancaster, uh, in Kanoi Township, you know, we have our power plant on the right. And uh, because we had some industrial zone land, uh, which is depicted on the left, uh, we, for many years, were looking for an energy partner, somebody that we could send steam to, because you can sell steam for a higher price than you can sell electrons. And we eventually found that partner in uh, Purdue Agribusiness and sold them uh, a parcel. And more importantly, they are now a partner in buying energy from us for the next 20 years in the form of steam. So what you're looking at in the uh, cutout photo in the bottom center is a, is a utility pipe rack. And on that, on that rack, there's four pipes. And two are sending product to Purdue uh, in the form of steam and process water. And coming back then is about 60% condensate from, from them, and then the use process water, which we re-clean up and provide them again. So, so Purdue, just like us, doesn't have any withdrawal of water into the Susquehanna, nor do they have any discharge. Um, the, our water actually comes from a pipe from the Elizabethtown wastewater treatment plant where we get that effluent, pipe it up River Road into our plant, clean it up again into the grade of water that we need to fill the boilers and ultimately make steam. So um, capacity is finite. I think I mentioned earlier we had 10.6 million cubic yards and we're just about used it up, but it, it lasted us for 30 years. So we had to embark over many years to try to be ready to expand, have capacity ready when that volume was used up. Um, we, we've been doing that over the last 10 years 
we we uh, got a permit and now we're constructing that um, as you see here and it's going to give us an extra 18 to 20 years of capacity and it's really hard to see but um, this is this is actually a berm and the, the new land the expanded landfill will go from here over top of the existing landfill so we get an extra 18 to 20 years of capacity just by using some engineering and geometric advantages without having to go out and start from scratch on a new field and we're sensitive to what well, we do have to go up 50 feet higher we're sensitive to what that will look like from across the river we, we've had a couple people that live over there that weren't very happy with our plans so what you see here is what the landfill will look like when we're finished um, you can sort of see the natural tree line and and above that is uh, some very unique um, we call it a landscape synthesis plan well, we'll do some natural succession and strategic tree planting so we can blend in uh, to the view on the lower Susquehanna Gorge there um, and minimize the aesthetic impact of our operations. Finally, um, we're, we're, still, um, we're still doing some uh, innovative stuff. All the ash that we get from our two waste energy plants goes to the landfill, about 170,000 tons a year. And uh, that that material will now go through this facility. We've partnered with a Dutch firm. They'll, they're going to pull out about 8,300 tons of material, small ferrous, all the way down to like the size of a copper BB. And um, it, it, it'll, again, uh, boost recycling and um, boost our finances. So here, all this type of innovation that we've done, this is sort of why we've done it. Um, by fully utilizing our assets and diversifying our revenue. Um, this is what the, the net rate that we've charged to the community over the last um, 20 years. So uh, we, we have invested hundreds of millions of dollars in the infrastructure, but we, through innovation and good fiscal management, we've been able to not rest that on the backs of um, the consumer. So the well, next five minutes here, I'm going to go pretty quick so we, we have some time. Um, so our system now, we're now up to, we're going to, we're going to manage more than a million tons of waste this year. Um, we're probably going to do $94 million next year. It'll probably eclipse $100 million. And, and um, it's, it's become very complicated. We, we, we have to, we're in the commodity markets now whether it's metals, uh, whether it's buying gas, futures, hedging electricity rates. Um, it, it's a lot more complicated, and um, this is why I have to hire people smarter than me um, to, to um, run the organization the way we need to. And, and hopefully, hopefully, um, most of you have noticed how, especially the last decade, we've really reached out deeper into the community uh, um, whether it's um, uh, sponsoring Longs Park or Music for Everyone or um, all different types or, um, of activities, we felt we needed to improve our brand. You know, we, I think we run an excellent organization. We protect the environment. We, we keep our rates fair. Uh, we make electricity, renewable energy in all, every different way. Um, but we had to get deeper into the community, and especially with Katie uh, and the work she's done with her crew the last seven years. But here's just an example of some of the things we've done. The Northwest Trail would still be under construction if, if we weren't involved. We've, been, we've really been the catalyst for almost all of that trail. And um, maybe you've been on the Farmingdale Trail in East Humpfield, and that's, that's an old landfill site that we purchased some years ago. And, uh, um, I'm gonna, this is one more slide. So what does it mean to you as a consumer, your household? And, and people aren't really aware for this, but it doesn't really have to do with the rest of the presentation, but I just wanted to throw it out there. So if you're in a, if you live in a municipality where you and your neighbor and everyone in the municipality has their waste con, the municipality contracts one company to go around and collect your whole town, typically, and these are, you know, the fee might be about $220. And um, I know maybe it's a little cheaper and some of you might be paying more than that, but I'm just using an average. 
So your household's gonna put out about one ton of waste on average across every municipality, one ton. And, and um, so 80% of that, 80% of that waste, 1,600 pounds, is going to come to us and get disposed. Now, we, we charge your municipality. So 80% of the 6280, which was on that line graph, we're going we're to collect about $50 based on your disposal needs. As a, as a, and then the recycling is now about 20%. That's the other 400 pounds that you're going to put in your green bin um, if you do it correctly. Right? If you do it incorrectly, it might be a little more. And, and that's about $50 a ton, so that's going to be about $10. And that comes to us, and then we pay pen waste. And then your hauler is going to charge you 130 or you, your municipality. Your, the unit fee to come bring two trucks by your house 52 times a year. So they're stopping in front of your house 104 times is $130. And then, then the municipality tax on stuff to run composting, educate, administer the program, send out the bills, and so forth. There's your $220. So with that, you can see we're less than a quarter of it, 50 over 220. So if we raise our rates $5, your rate should conceivably go up $5 over 220. So most of the fee, most of the cost in providing you the service you get is not uh, does not come to us. Frankly, I think that's one of the best bargains around. My, I hate to tell you, my cable bill is more than that a month. So um, I think we're done.